Uh, hey, Julie. Yes, Sandra. So, like, so what is this? Well, you know, it's it's that time of year again when uh, the big streamers like Netflix, uh, along with uh, Hallmark and Lifetime, they start churning out their holiday films. I don't know. I feel like there's something about Christmas movies that sort of brings out these feelings of warmth and yeah, okay. nostalgia. So, so what is this? Like, like, what am I watching? This is this is Falling for Christmas, starring Lindsay Lohan. Like, this this is her huge comeback of the year. Okay. Do we have to watch the whole thing? No, I mean, this is just an example of a Christmas movie. Like, it, it could be any movie, you know? I'm, I'm just trying to get us to think about the genre so I can get to my point. Okay. So, the point I'm trying to make with Andrew is that the Christmas movie landscape has fundamentally changed. Usually when we think of Christmas movies, we might think of Home Alone, Elf, or a Charlie Brown Christmas, right? But that's not the kind of Christmas movie that I want to get into today, because there's a new holiday film that's emerged in the past 20 years, and there's hundreds of them made every year. I'm talking about Hallmark movies, or, or Lifetime films. This year alone, Hallmark came out with 40 new films on their 2022 roster. Lifetime had 26, and The Great American Family, which is a Christian cable network, had 18. Like, that's a lot of movies for one holiday. But this year, there's a twist. It's all about culture wars, and somehow Christmas movies are the latest battleground. So by that I mean there's a huge difference in opinion on who should be represented in these films and how, based on belief systems, values, and even politics. But in order to understand how Christmas movies are the latest battleground for this, I need to get Andrew to understand how these films are made, piece by piece. And for that, I'm gonna get my friend Stacey Lee Kong to help him. But for now, back to Lindsay. You're gonna pass him that popcorn? You want some popcorn? Is it extra butter? Don't take the bowl. Okay. Um, we don't have Die Hard, no. do we? So hey there, uh, bringing you into our studio now. And, and you know, like I don't want to say that I was dragged kicking and screaming uh, into this place because I always jump at the chance to speak with you, Stacey Lee Kong. Sure, but you did not want to talk to me about Christmas movies. <laughs> I know. It, it was a little unexpected. I'll, I'll admit that. You're, so, you're going to enjoy it. It's going to be okay. <laughs> Stacey Lee Kong, of course, uh, writer, editor, freelancer, uh, creator of the Friday Things pop culture newsletter. Yes. And, and we need your help, but but more than that, I need your help. To I'm understand. here for you. Like, like full disclosure, so so my producer Julie did have to sit me down and say, okay, Andrew, so so this is what we're talking about, and here's why it's actually important. Yeah. Yeah, and and so you're gonna guide us through holiday movies, and yes. and I mean, so I know why it's important because you know Candace Cameron Bure, like I've been following that that story, right? Like right. so, yeah, how she shifted TV networks to focus on a network that would. Uh, what it's was more it? family values. Yeah, promote sort of traditional marriage yes. at its core. But to understand how Christmas movies have become sort of the battlefield uh, of today. <laughs> For this culture war? Yeah, exactly. We, we need to understand the, the terrain, so yes. to speak. And that's where you come in. Uh, yes. And this giant empty so space giant that okay. you are going to populate with... With, ideas. With ideas, okay. with tropes. So also I think we should clarify, we're not just talking about like any Christmas movie. We're talking about a very particular subset, which is the Hallmark, Lifetime, streaming services are getting yes. into it, like the yes. holiday romance. Okay. So if you have watched any of these, I know you haven't, but some people <laughs> will not yeah. be surprised by what I say next. There are these tropes. There are these things that you can just be sure are going to show up. There's a formula. There's a formula. Yeah, I, I I'm going to tell it, it to you. It. Okay. First of all... We have this briefcase. It's going to come in really, really handy. All right. And the second thing. <laughs> You've really prepared for this. <laughs> yes. Do you love my clip art? A barn. Okay. A barn. Okay. Business and a barn. So, so tell me, why so, am I looking at these right now? Why you're looking at these is the protagonist of every holiday romance movie is a big city professional with a cool career. <laughs> right. She yeah. is a real go-getter. Yeah. And her career is like curator, journalist, uh, you know, like art is, is gallery. Is journalist a cool career? They don't days? actually <laughs> know what journalism means, <laughs> right? right? Okay. So this is the, I, we could okay. do a whole show on right. why journalism in holiday movies is like not real at all and also deeply unprofessional. But I get you, like like some sort of but like, like high powered kind of niche like creative, kind of cool, yeah, yes, cool sure. career. Yeah, I get it. But then, so she lives in the big city for sure. Right. 
But then she has to go to a sometimes suburban but often rural hometown or place. So right. sometimes it's because it's her hometown and she's like going back there. Sometimes it's because there's some work reason where she needs to go. So like my all-time favorite is the person who has to go to the small town to get the massive Christmas tree for <laughs> The like right. big unveiling of their corporate Christmas tree back in the city. Right. Anyways, and then more tropes come in. But importantly, it's it's someplace quaint, yes. someplace homey Small, and cozy. There's snow. And, yeah, very sure. community driven. I gotcha. Yeah, yeah. I gotcha. Maybe only one or two street lights, but that's fine. Okay, so Kay. cool career going to a small town. More tropes. What's next? All right. They're all love stories, aren't they? They are all love stories. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually want you to oh. guess what this could possibly be about. <laughs> uh, okay, well, th well, this is the easy part, and I'm assuming I'm I'm not wrong, right? That yes. Well, so when she goes back to or goes to the like rural place, she either reconnects with a former enemy sure. or lover or like friend or like whatever, or she meets a new love interest. So this is about love, yes. Right, okay. What do you, what do you think this is? Well, the, so aside from this person have a, having an existential crisis and a mental breakdown, it looks like, I mean, just problems. Exactly, okay. so it is. So it is that <laughs> so there's a problem to solve, but right. it's a very particular type of problem. Okay. So it cannot be a problem that is unsolvable. It is a problem that is, it really only exists to bring the characters together. So like the Christmas tree lights are not going to get lit up in time. The concert could not go on because the song was not written. Right. Whatever it is, it's a thing that is big enough to cause some dramatic tension, but you know, manageable enough. Right, be I, I, I get you because I mean, passion needs opportunity. Absolutely. Is, okay, yeah, I got you. Absolutely. I'm following, I'm following. You're doing so well. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. <clears throat> Aw, here we go. Yeah. So this is the, every movie needs a happy ending, right? Yes. <laughs> and some politics. <laughs> okay, so then the protagonist and her love interest who like ideally wears a lot of plaid. He's probably very burly. He definitely does not own a suit. This like, is really specific. It's very day. specific. Yeah. Um, and he, like they have to come together to solve the problem. Right. And in the process, they not only fall in love, she learns the true meaning of Christmas. <laughs> yes. Very important. Gotcha, okay. So, but then there's this like overarching trope that I think is actually the most important. And that is that, the, the idea of a good life that these movies and these, like every movie has these tropes, the idea of a good life that the, right. these tropes kind of add up to is very um, conservative. So mm -hmm. it is traditional, love is between a man and a woman. It is, you know, sort of this like family values, the next natural thing is you get married and you have kids and you do all of these things. And so there's kind of an overarching republicanism to, a lot of the themes in these movies. And, th and that this is a pattern, right? So, yes. so consistently across many movies, you see yes. this sort of singular idea of what yes. a happy ending ought to look like. But also, I think even more than just the happy ending, it's yeah. also like, what is a good life? So where sure. should you live? Yeah. Yeah. And what should your community look like? Because the other part of these movies is that they are overwhelmingly white. And so if there are racialized characters, they're often side characters. And unless it's a movie specifically aimed at a particular group. So there are more, for example, romances featuring black couples now. Um, but it just, it gives this idea of life that doesn't actually match up to like my life or your life. Yes. But yes. they're vastly, like they're just so popular and there are so many of them that it seems kind of silly to ignore this huge messaging around what a good life looks and, like. And so now it's becoming a little clearer to me how right. this has become something of a battlefield for today's culture war. It's not just the lumberjacks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so I, I think I, I get the picture. Although there's still a part of me that thinks, man, like Christmas movies is such a weird venue for this, right? But when you lay it out like this, I yes. suppose it's... And I think it's like, it is a weird venue, but kind of not a weird venue in that for a long time, Christmas movies were for kids. Like when we think about yeah. the classics that we grew up with, we were just talking about the claymation Rudolph. Like they're kids movies. That's right, that's right. But... What happened was Hallmark in the early, late 90s, kind of early 2000s, realized that there's 
just a lot of interest in love stories. Well, and a lot of money at And stake, a lot of money. Right. So, like, a lot of money. Okay. Um, and so it becomes, I think there's an incentive to just perpetuate the same formula. But what we're going to see is that as audiences change, Hallmark and Lifetime, which are the two biggies, they had to kind of update the formula. They have to figure out ways to make it work in 2022 without losing the familiarity of the things that we already like. Because like right. the, fami the familiarity is the value proposition. What we want is to watch a movie where we know that everything's going to be okay. The predictability, the, exactly. the, the like, coziness of it. It's yeah, very cozy. Right. But you can't have cozy and racist. So unfortunately, or not fortunately for a lot of people, Hallmark and Lifetime have been updating the formula a bit. And streaming services are getting into it. Right. But then that leaves the sort of larger culture war in Western society right now where there's this move towards progressivism and also a move towards conservatism. Can you tell that the road only gets bumpier from here? Uh, we're going to take a quick commercial break. Uh, we've got a lot more to discuss at the desk. Don't go anywhere. All right, so uh, hey, welcome back. This isn't about that. Uh, very unlike the kind of shows we've done up until this point, and we have Stacey Lee Kong to thank for that. Thank you. I know you don't really mean that. I do. I know I do. And, and so today we're, we're trying to sort through, um, you know, Christmas movies and specific kinds of Christmas movies and, and how it is that they have become such a battleground for the culture wars of today. And, and you are going to take us through a little bit of a journey through time, right, in terms of these movies, because they're, they're instructive. They're very instructive. Right. Because yes. the, the, the landscape, there has been changes over the last little while. There have been, yeah. but maybe not as many as you would expect. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Fair point. So um, we should also acknowledge that we're, I'm going to start in 2018, which is more than a decade after the first Christmas movie, almost two decades actually after the first sort of TV Christmas movie, and well after Hallmark realized how lucrative these could be. Right. So there has been some change, but it took a long time, okay. and it's yeah. like not quite as much as we would like. Okay. Also, I have props. <laughs> This is, this is what this easel is here Welcome for. to my TED Talk. What is this? A gingerbread romance? So, a gingerbread okay. romance. Do you want a little hint? You can make great tree trunks by wrapping sandwich twists in parchment paper. I made a lot of models when I was in architecture school. Thanks. This is one of four movies that came out in 2018 from Hallmark. This one is starring Tia Maori and Dwayne Henry. Um, it was one of four movies, sorry, starring black characters. So that was the first time in our year really? 2018. So that, wait, 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 wait. So that's real? So this, that's, this 2018 is was the first year we saw one of these kind of made for TV Christmas movies on uh, Hallmark. On Hallmark, okay. For black people. Wow. And that's the other thing is that the idea is that these are for black people. This is not like everybody is watching them. They they were like a strategic Mm. sort of niche addition. Okay. So it's not that we haven't seen Christmas movies featuring black people before, but it's that Hallmark specifically did not. This very intentional not, decision. Yeah. yeah. You know, like this this big, ma this is a pretty major change. Okay. It took until 2018. I get you. Okay. okay. Next. Double, uh, sorry. Double yes, holiday. double holiday. Yeah. I don't know much about Hanukkah. Dinosaur for Christmas cookies? No. So this is one of two movies from 2019 that Hallmark produced featuring Jewish characters. So this is not the first time ever that Hallmark mentioned Hanukkah, but it is the first time in 2019 that they saw a strategic, financial, mm. you know, capitalist reason to branch into other religions. Right. And that's... Hard to believe that it wasn't featured earlier you that, would think right? 2019 but is it surprising well i, I mean based on the tropes right like optimistic based you on, want to be, but sure sure yeah. but i mean i think based on the formula the formula is very specific like right. christmas and christmas movies for a long time it wasn't about religion overtly but it was understanding that you were speaking to christian or at least people who were sort of culturally christian that's who your audience was right what else do you have here okay the Christmas setup featuring Fran Fine. 
Um, so in this is really interesting because this movie came out in 2020 and it is a Lifetime movie. And so Lifetime announced that they were featuring their very first LGBTQ plus couple in August of 2020. And then a month later, Hallmark re- uh, talked about how they were releasing their first LGBTQ oh, okay. plus movie. Hmm. However, Hallmark had actually released their slate of movies in July. So it was not originally on the slate of movies. Wow, okay. My suspicion is that it was very late breaking because this movie received so much press that it seemed silly not to include that. And as, as you're going through these milestones, it's just occurring to me now, you haven't really talked about whether there was any backlash to these. There absolutely was. Was there? There's yeah. always backlash. So. Yeah. Anytime any one of these pushes, like every time there's a push forward, and particular with the Christmas setup, yeah. you will see some kind of backlash from conservative media, mm. especially Fox News, but like not only Fox News. The, the next thing. So in 2021, Lifetime fe- uh, released a movie featuring the first lesbian couple under the Christmas tree. And that's also, I think, pretty important because the type of representation that we see it's always coming in drips and drabs. So we'll Mm. see gay men before we'll see gay women. We'll see probably a lot of times both of those before we see people of color. Like this is actually pretty diverse because this is like a a racialized person as well. And is this, I mean, maybe coincidentally or not coincidentally, this is also around the time where we started to see a bit of a a fracturing, right? Of the landscape. Our last moment. Candace Cameron Bure. DJ Tanner. DJ Tanner from Full House, yes. From Full House. So. DJ, sorry, no, Candace. Her actual name is <laughs> yeah. Candace. Um, she leaves Hallmark, so yeah. she had been not just a, you know, a Hallmark holiday star. She also starred in like a, a mystery series. She was doing very well with Hallmark, and she decided to leave um, for Great American Family. She's starring in one of their. 2022 slate of Christmas movies. Um, And she said, I want to actually read the quote because she spoke to the Wall Street Journal and she said that she made the jump because she knew that the people behind Great American Family were Christians that love the Lord and they wanted to promote faith programming and good family entertainment. Mm -hmm. She also said that she believed that the network would keep traditional marriage at the core. Right. So that's really what we're talking about here. We're talking about two ideas about what a good life looks like, to go back to those tropes. And there's one sort of segment of media that is moving towards a more progressive, inclusive, diverse idea of what a good life is. Maybe one day we will have a romance set in a city. And then there's this whole other one that would like to not just maintain the conservatism of old Hallmark, but probably go backwards. Mm. And and so what do you, because I'm I'm trying to listen to what you're saying and thinking about whether at any point you have enjoyed these movies and whether your enjoyment of them has has, has changed. changed over so time. So I, yes, have loved these movies. And I actually have a good friend who we're both in media, we're both cultural critics, and every year we'd be like, why are we doing this? Like, why do we enjoy this so much? But we still did. Even as we recognized the flaws, even as we recognized that they didn't really represent us, we were nowhere in these movies unless we wanted to be the sassy sidekick. But for me, I think what has changed is that the comfort isn't there anymore. Like, it's mm. it's become too hard to ignore the parts that I don't like, the parts that aren't representative of my life or the people I know. But also, I just don't think this is what we should be saying a good life is. Right, but, so, but I guess the question I'm trying to get to is... Can, can can we have two things at once, right? And, yeah. and so, like, like is is Candace Cameron Bure a villain for for wanting to sort of portray the values that are important to her and to do the movies that she wants to do? Like, that's a that's tricky a good one, question. right? I don't think she's a villain, but I think the idea that her values require the oppression of other people is mm. pretty villainous. So that's the that's the challenge, right? Like, yes, we can just enjoy these things and try and turn our brains off. And if you can do that in 2022, you deserve to do that. But I don't think you can actually ignore for too long the underpinnings. That's the problem, is that... And, and this is the problem of being the person who thinks this way and watching anything, to be fair. But if you care about other people, to me, it's a little bit harder to be like, ah, yes, we'll just watch Candace Cameron Bure in her other movies when you know her other movies are explicitly about oppressing people. 
they're explicitly about making sure that we, as people, think about family and life and values as one thing, hmm. and not often what we are. And I guess this is the the intersection between, I mean, business, money, identity, politics, race, sex. All of those things. It, it just sort of goes on and on. But that's what makes life interesting, right? <laughs> okay. Yes. Stacey Lee Kong, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. <laughs> we'll be back on the other side. Hi, my name is Brock. My favorite Christmas movie is Die Hard. Uh, it's a classic. Bruce Willis and the Vents. Uh, we'll go to the coast, we'll have a few laughs. Uh, and then you got Hans Gruber as well. One of the greatest villains of all time. I think it's definitely Charlie Brown. Uh, I love the soundtrack. Um, I love it when his friends come together. He has that little sad, ugly tree and his friends all come together and they make it a beautiful one. Uh, it just really gets you in the feels every time. What are the feels? That's um, <laughs> sort of it warms the, uh, the cockles of your heart. You know, that's a saying, right? Isn't it? Hi, my name's Christina. My favorite holiday movie is The Holiday. It's got uh, romance, a little love story, it's got self-empowerment, and best of all, Christmas fettuccine. Hi, my name's Oliver, and my favorite Christmas movie of all time is Home Alone. I mean, it reminds me of my childhood, like what parents didn't leave their kids in the 70s to go on vacation, right? Hi, my name's Kit. I use they, them pronouns, and my favorite holiday movie is Lord of the Rings. I know what some people are going to say, but firstly, The Fellowship leaves Rivendell on December 25th, and secondly, the vibes are just there. It is a holiday movie. I'm Erin, and my favorite uh, holiday movie is about a boy, which people don't think of as a holiday movie, but it is. Not only does Hugh Grant uh, thrive on the funds derived from his father writing Santa's Super Slay, but it's about the importance of connection with each other and being together. And what is more Christmassy than that? Hi, I'm Julie, and my favorite Christmas movie is Love Actually. I know it's controversial, but there's just so many stars and celebrity, and I just, I can't help it. My name is Josie, and my favorite Christmas movie is Meet Me in St. Louis. Judy Garland, have yourself a Merry Christmas. Need I say more? Hi, I'm Adrian. My favorite Christmas movie is Guardians of the Galaxy. I haven't seen it yet, but I'm sure it's great. Hi, I'm Laura, and my favorite holiday movie is the classic The Grinch Who Stole Christmas. The Boris Karloff version, the who's that don't haunt your dreams. It is lovely and heartwarming. The Grinch's heart grew three sizes that day. And my kids love it so much that my daughter, when she was three or four, actually watched it once a week, on average, even in July. I'm Alex Crest. I can't choose just one, so I'm gonna be quick. I got FUBAR 2, which is um, a recent addition to my life. If you haven't seen it, you gotta. Um, hailing from Edmonton, it is special. Um, Christmas Vacation is my classic. That was our family one always, and I loved it because to me, it's like a very true representation of how families really are at Christmas. Am I dingling? Yep. That's you. <laughs> I was like, what is that sound? Hey, my name is uh, Andrew. My favorite holiday movie is definitely Home Alone because like the music is just fantastic. Uh, the, the zany like obstacles are, are just like what every boy dreams of running and maybe like subjecting other people to. And uh, Kevin McAllister, he's just a bad mother Mother 